Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are, everyone. Happy, happy International Women's Day. It is my pleasure to be with you today. My name is Sheila Boynton. I serve as the National States Chair for Million Mentors and also am the founder of Learning Blade and Ready for Industry and a true STEM woman myself as an engineer in my younger days. Um, and definitely uh, happy to be with you all today. I think you're in for a super, really great treat. Uh, if it's lunchtime on the East Coast, maybe this is a great way to spend your lunch hour, uh, central time, et cetera. Just really happy to have all of you with us. Um, as you know, Million Women Mentors is really an effort to encourage and lead more girls and women into STEM careers and actually help them stay in those careers. And so today, really, we're gonna focus on the International Women's Day theme of investing in women and accelerating progress. And what's cool is we are going to hear from four different organizations who have been vested in this and they're, they're leading, very much leading in this area. And so very excited to introduce our panelists today. So Kyle, if you can go to the next screen. Uh, we are joined by Orietta Verdugo. I hope I said that right, close, close. And uh, from Intel, each of them are going to introduce themselves in a minute. Uh, Kate Maloney, the executive director of Infosys U Foundation USA. Kathleen Martinez from BP. Smitha Corley from PepsiCo. And just very, very excited to be here. Uh, I know we have many, many people on. So if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, please do. Since this is a larger webinar, we don't have the ability to take people off of uh, silent to let you all ask your questions. But if you do have some questions, burning questions from anything you hear today, hopefully we'll have a little time at the end uh, to address those. So you can put them in there. And if we don't, we certainly can uh, get with you later. You know, Million Mentors, we launched almost now 11 years ago with the goal of really encouraging and getting more girls to go into STEM. And at the time that we did this, uh, you know, women and girls in STEM was not really talked about and as much um, as we see it today. And I'm not gonna say that we would take all the credit for that, but I think we certainly had a hand in elevating the importance of women and girls in STEM and computer science and CTE careers. And so that is something that's powerful as well for making sure that we are able to, you know, bring more pipeline into this uh, focus, but then also keep that pipeline uh, engaged because some of the data shows us that in the first 10 years, 50% of the women that go into STEM drop out. And so, you know, that's certainly one of the things that we want to try to address. So as we start the day um, or this, this hour that we have, I um, also want to give a shout out to Ted Wells, who is on, um, on the call listening, who is the president of STEM Connector, and Joe Weber, the CEO of POD uh, slash STEM Connector, Million Mentors. They will uh, Joe will be joining us a little bit later to talk about some of the international work that's going on with Million Mem Mentors, but we're going to start off by our uh, talking to our amazing panel. So if we can go to our panel now, Kylie, I'd love to just start off by having each of you introduce yourselves, uh, tell a little bit about yourself, and then also just what does International Women's Day kind of mean to you as a woman? And so uh, love to Love to hear from you, and I think we'll start with Orieta. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Orieta. Um, I'm based in Arizona. I'm a first-gen college graduate and the first engineer in my family. I grew up in rural Arizona in small mining and farming communities. And when I was in high school, my dream school was to go to MIT. But I couldn't afford the $50 admission application. So I didn't apply. I went to ASU and I got my in, in, uh, in, uh, engineering degree there, but later did get two master degrees from MIT. My career um, started uh, in operations and manufacturing. Um, after undergrad, I went to go work for a gas turbine factory and I fell in love with operations. And my dream job became to run a factory one day. So the first thing I did was say, hey, where are the women factory managers? And how can I get a hold of them to tell me, like, how do I get there? The company had 
over 350,000 employees at the time. And in our business unit, I did get a hold of a few women who had been factory managers and I called them right away. But what I learned was um, I worked in five different factories. And what I learned was that there wasn't enough women. They were never in the factories that I worked in. And so I had to depend on men. And it was a realization that this mentorship really had to come from, how do I learn from the best in whatever it is that I want to do? And so um, I ended up becoming a manufacturing manager and I helped start up and commission the substrate packaging uh, technology development factory at Intel. And once I got my dream job, my dream changed. And now I wanted to know like, how do I how do how do I run a business? How do I help with technology? And so I pivoted my career and I started working in business development and incubation and became the general manager for our hospitality vertical at Intel, where we're working on technology to solve problems for hotels, restaurants, and the entertainment uh, industry. And more recently, I decided to work in corporate social impact. And so right now I'm the chief of staff for our chief diversity and inclusion officer, but I'm also the interim director of the Intel Foundation and our corporate giving. And in this space, I get to really look at items that we really care about. And that's how do we get more women and um, more youth of underrepresented groups to be part of STEM? Because really STEM, you don't, it's not, you don't need to be a gender, you don't need to be a certain height, and anybody can do it. And so I'm so excited to be talking with all of you today about my journey and how Intel is imp impacting our youth and um, students as well are, as the women professionals. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Orietta. And it's amazing background that you have, and it's, it's going to be a pleasure to hear more from you today. So love to hear from Smitha from PepsiCo. Thank you, Sheila. Hello, and happy Women's International Day. Thank you to Million Women Mentors and Learning Blade for the opportunity to reflect and share insights on this International Women's Day. My name is Mita Corley. In my current role, I serve as the Senior Director for Global Technology uh, Auditing in PepsiCo's internal audit organization. I also serve as the liaison between PepsiCo globally and the STEM Connector Million Women Mentors organization. I'm honored to share a bit about PepsiCo and our MWM initiative with you today. PepsiCo is a founding member of the Million Women Mentors Initiative and current Gold Level sponsor. I've been blessed to be involved with the initiative since the inception of our partnership. Why International Women's Day is important to me. Um, for me, International Women's Day represents a time to reflect and celebrate the progress we've made as women. I can recall defining moments in my STEM education and career on which I'm able to look back and appreciate the progress that's been made. It also affords us pause to recognize there's more work to be done for women to realize their potential and secure equitable access to opportunity. And similar to Orietta, I actually um, went to school with the intent to be an environmental engineer. And some of y'all have heard this story before. Um, I graduated from Texas A&M, not with an engineering degree, however, when I went to school, there were very few women role models. And I'm a firm believer that if you can see it, you can be it. And without that inspiration, um, I found a new passion uh, as I transitioned to the business school. So I was the first person um, in my family to not have a science degree or an engineering degree or be a physician. Um, I actually went to the business school and found my passion in programming and translating um, those technical capabilities into value-added capabilities for the business. Um, so I've been with PepsiCo now for approaching 27 years. Uh, 23 of those years were in the core information technology organization, delivering supply chain capability and strategy globally for the organization. And in the most four recent years, um, had the privilege to lead our global technology audit. So STEM is a passion of mine and inspiring women and girls to pursue education in STEM and have that ability to have safe spaces with mentors so they don't have that uh, same experience where they feel like they may be pioneers or 
trailblazers and don't have someone to inspire them to stay the course. Sheila, I'll turn it back to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Smita. And, and again, I think you guys are hearing these rich backgrounds that, uh, that these women have and love to hear from Kathleen from BP. Thank you so much, Sheila. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Happy International Women's Day. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. My name is Kathleen Mar. Martinez, I am with BP, um, and I've been with BP for 12 years, and just want to tell you a little bit about my background. I am not a, um, a STEMinist. Um, I'm a STEM um, person. I am a STEMinist. Um, I did not have a background in STEM education, but it was a love of learning, I think, and engaging more young women and, and individuals from economically disadvantaged backgrounds, I think, in the opportunities that um, a STEM background can afford them and their families. So I am um, a first generation high school graduate and college graduate. I come from a very large Hispanic family. I am the youngest of 14. And um, it was um, a wonderful experience growing up in such a large family. But one thing that uh, my parents were not able to really do themselves was to guide us in how do you pursue higher education and how do you find access to opportunities or when is the, the timeline for applications or et cetera. And so um, I went to school at the University of Texas in San Antonio, my beloved UTSA. Um, I am a roadrunner and I love um, the fact that I still am engaged with UTSA. Going to school two hours away from Laredo, Texas, Texas might as well been um, um, moving to Manhattan and going to school at NYU or anywhere else. It was certainly um, an ambitious goal um, because it was a first and um, I was really excited about that. I have a degree in business marketing, but I've done a wonderful um you know, assortment of work in my career. And um, so I started with sales. Um, I ended up working with um, a chamber of commerce and did international work. I then worked lobbying with that chamber, which took me to Washington, D.C. And I worked on Capitol Hill um, as a press secretary to a member of Congress. And then I went back into marketing um, at Southwest Airlines. And then I was pulled into philanthropy and that became a um, something that was very close to my heart because it gave me the opportunity to invest in um, in education and in initiatives that really inspired the next generation. Um, I worked in um, financial industry, um, ran the um, the um, the charitable foundations for two banks. When I transitioned into BP, into the um, what we call our international, I'm sorry, our integrated energy company. And I get to do in this current work, I am part of the future talent team. And so the work that I do is really centered around how do we engage the next generation um, in STEM education and in opportunities um, that STEM um, can afford them, as well as how do we engage them in industry and helping us reach next net zero by 2050. Um, and so I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, I, I often say that there are so many people making an impact in STEM who are not themselves of a STEM background. And I am one of those, um, but I do believe that STEM affords um, many girls and also many boys, but many girls a wonderful way to expand um, their world and also provide a sustainable livelihood for their families and to then inspire education within the trajectory of th their families. So I'm excited to be here again and um, just a little bit about me and BP. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Kathleen. And then turning it over to my friend, Kate Maloney. Great. Um, so nice to be with all of you. My name is Kate Maloney, and I have the privilege of being the executive director of the Infosys Foundation USA. We are the corporate social responsibility arm of Infosys, the global tech consulting company. Uh, normally, I'm in New York dialing in today. Full disclosure, I'm in North Carolina. So if anyone is on the line near Charlotte, um, nice to be proximate to you. And happy International Women's Day to everyone. It's quite 
powerful. Even in my Uber coming to the office today, there was a gentleman driving me who seemed like, you know, maybe right out of the gate, I wouldn't have thought he would know what the day was. And it was his first greeting to me, uh, which was very, I think we've come a long way with just the recognition of what today means. Uh, our foundation is smack dab in the middle of the STEM world. I am working with educators and students to raise and increase access to STEM, to computer science, maker education, and a lot right now around digital skilling. Uh, my background that really brought me, I think, ultimately to this role is a passion for education. And I've had that since I was a young girl, and it's sort of thread, not always through my professional role, but always what I did on the side, all of the organizations I would volunteer with or raise my hand to engage with. And I pursued a career in international economics and international development. So I did a lot of work outside of the United States for a number of years, similar to Kathleen, that all started on Capitol Hill way back in the day, um, but then spent a lot of time with KPMG, working in, like I said, most emerging markets other than the US, but always with this awareness about the power of business to have a social impact. And Infosys has a purpose statement that is around amplifying human potential. And they also continue to tout, and this is, goes back to the founders, the value of lifelong learning. So I feel like I am now as the representative for those values, really trying to help have an impact in the lane of STEM. We know women, we're 40% of the workforce, perhaps even 50 in some instances, but our representation in tech drops down to 25%. And if we look even in communities within that, our African-American colleagues and friends or Spanish speaking young girls, that drops precipitately precipitously down to about six or 8%. So we have a really big challenge before us. And I'm inspired by days like this because I'm reminded of all the great work we get to do to level the playing field for girls in STEM. And through all of our programs and partnerships, that's what I'm doing on a regular basis. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thanks, thanks all of you for making the time today. And I think that is super cool that some random guy in your Uber knew that it was International Women's Day. I mean, that's kind of a a little bit of chills for, for me personally to hear that it, we have made some progress for sure. And as, you know, again, like some of you, you know, I was like, oh, there were only two girls in my engineering class um, back in the day. I'm older than everybody here. And, you know, it was very difficult when I first became an engineer. And I told some of you this story this week as we were together that one one of the first times I wanted to go out on a job site as an engineer in the South, I lived in Tennessee, I live in Tennessee, and um, my boss told me I could not go because they would not accept a woman and a woman of color as an engineer on the job site. And so that was a big slap in my face to wake me up to say, you know, we have work to do. Uh, definitely things have changed. But as someone said, I believe we still got a ways to go. And so uh, I think events like this are really important to highlight the importance of, you know, the diversity that we need and thought diversity that we need in the STEM workspace. And I do believe Kathleen and Kate, like it doesn't have to be, you don't have to only have a STEM background to be active and to be impactful in this as we will. Uh, saw this week that I think you guys are going to talk about. So um, I'm going to go backwards now, Kate, I'm going to start with you and just, you know, talk a little bit about some of the strategies that the Infosys Foundation and Infosys has been engaged in to try to move the needle on, on this whole conversation around women and girls in STEM. Oh, thank you. Well, we, as a foundation, we try to attack it two different ways. Uh, we think about the power of the educator. So there is something magical that's happening in classrooms across the country. And if we bring exposure to educators, that's likely to have a ripple effect across maker spaces and in coding clubs and all of the energy that happens in a traditional setting. We're also trying to do all the wraparound or maybe not all of it, but some of it, um, to make sure that girls outside of the traditional classroom have exposure to STEM and they feel excited by it. They're inspired to join, they feel it's for them. And we have to get a little creative. So sometimes it's inviting them in at the intersection of tech and music. 
or it's maybe the intersection of tech and art or, or creative ways that girls can find solutions to everyday problems in their lives, which they like to do. Uh, our foundation is also investing in the maker education universe. And that's a little bit less known, but philosophically we feel that maker education is kind of that on-ramp using whatever materials are in someone's environment, they can start to think and feel ultimately that they could be a creator of technology, not just a consumer. So we are doing programs with boys and girls clubs, with museums, with maker spaces, with um, all of the nonprofits you would imagine in the STEM encoding uh, environment. And I think a few of us have cheated because we spent time together in Texas this week, Sheila, Kathleen, and I, but we've come, we've joined forces between BP and Emphasis to design a girls in STEM mentor program. So this is another example of how do we bring exposure to the concepts, but wrap that around with opportunities to engage with women leaders, like amazing mentors that have raised their hand from both companies. And this is, um, I think, a thread of what we do. And I'll, I'll close on this point that we have to teach these girls the, the technical, the underpinning, like the real, where the rubber hits the road skills that will help them advance. But what each of the girls shared yesterday in the room, and we were with 100 of them in Texas, perhaps 48 hours ago, was the power of the camaraderie that came from working with other girls. And each, as we went around the room and Sheila moderated a conversation with them, they spoke about their excitement for the different STEM concepts, but they said they love working with their peers. They, they spoke about the bonding and the connection. And I think Kathleen and I later tried to pull back on that to say, what's happening there is exactly what will happen later in your career to be aware of other women, to look for opportunities, to pick other women up. And we tried to say, stick together. Like it's so important. You are threading your own social capital and networks, even at age 13 or 14. So a powerful program that we literally just kind of had all the energy in the room uh, a few days ago, but that gives you some sense of where we put our investments from the foundation. Let's so impactful. And yes, obviously, we did have a really amazing week uh, being together and just seeing the energy. And again, we we thought we we're going to inspire them, but quite frankly, they inspired us. <laughs> so it was just one of those moments that you remember, this is why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, so maybe to turn to you, Smita, and talk a little bit about, you know, some of the work that PepsiCo has been doing around, you know, sort of this work, obviously, as one of the founding um, members of Million Mentors, and we've been working with PepsiCo since the inception, you know, you guys have history in this work. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, some of the work that you feel has been impactful from the PepsiCo side. Sure. Thanks, Sheila. In the nearly 11 years since the inception of Million Women Mentors and the initiative, we've expanded to 10 global chapters. So PepsiCo is a global organization that operates in 200 plus countries, uh, bringing smiles to people through our food and beverage portfolio. And with that, um, uh, you know, we get the question all the time, uh, PepsiCo has STEM? Well, of course we do. And we've expanded um, that footprint uh, to meet the global needs of our, of our employee community, as well as the communities in which we work and service. Um, so our focus has been um, traditionally on uh, a lot of external partnerships and mentoring of young women and girls in STEM, um, all the way from the Girl Scouts through other community partnerships. Uh, and I see one of our uh, Canadian team members on the call as well. Uh, partnerships with SHAD in Canada, partnerships with IWISH and STEM Southwest in Ireland. Um, and then we've, uh, in the last three years, and actually today is their anniversary, the Turkey uh, chapter stood up um, a Science Girls Academy um, to bring that science education again to uh, young women to inspire them to pursue career uh, and, and education leading up to those careers in STEM. Um, in more recent years, we've also turned the lens internally, um, recognizing uh, the stat that was mentioned earlier, females in STEM careers leave the profession within the first 12 years of their careers. And it's a staggering 50%. So how can we really 
um, move the needle internally for our associates as well and focus on um, not just the attraction piece and building that pipeline with our external partnerships, but also looking at retention and development of women. And so there's um, some strategies that are in place, uh, for example, affinity groups. Um, so in addition to employee resource groups that have mentoring programs and have a female focus, there have been recent um, affinity groups that have been launched like Security, which really supports attraction, retention, and development of women in information security, privacy, and IT risk management. And then we also have uh, partnerships with global organizations like Women in Data. We recently announced um, that one of our uh, founding, actually, um, mentors in the Women Mentor, uh, Million Women Mentors uh, movement here at PepsiCo has recently been appointed to the board of Women in Data. Um, Executive Women's Forum, which is a risk and, and governance focused and security organization, as well as the Society of Women Engineers. And then we have local, um, you know, we also have activation in local um, colleges and universities where we do mentoring there as well, so that again, we can attract um, STEM talent into the organization. Um, so those are some of the, the strategies. And, and really, if we think about PepsiCo's broader goals, all of the things that we do from a million women mentors and STEM connector perspective are aligned with our broader organization goals. And that's important um, to ensure that they become sticky, right? So we uh, publicly announced a few years ago um, our goal to achieve 50% of uh, women in managerial roles by 2025, and we're trending very well there. Um, and some of this is due to greater flexibility and benefits and policies, development and retention training, building resilient women-owned businesses, mentorship and workforce readiness programs, and empowering women in the agricultural supply chain, which people don't recognize a lot of times. Agro is a huge STEM um, uh, uh, capability as well. And so a lot of it's been focused in and around how do we um, ensure pay parity and pay transparency, management uh, levels at parity, and then leaning into that from a STEM perspective as well. Yes. And, and so important just to give a shameless plug, like Learning Blade, we have an agricultural mission and people are like, why do you have agriculture? I'm like, we have to feed the earth and we've got to use some technology sort of exercises to be able to do that. And we need the innovation of our youth to help us as we move, as the population grows. Right. And it's um, it's supporting um, women in uh, agriculture in some of our communities globally. Um, it's looking at things like water scarcity and uh, uh, um, resource uh, needs, but also looking at the degree of digitalization in agriculture today, right? Um, when we think about how much is moving towards artificial intelligence, but also the capabilities to be able to sustain um, uh, the, the, the raw materials and ingredients that go yeah. into our products, right? So. For sure, for sure. And I think, you know, that's one of those important points to make. Like, you know, STEM, we think of as science, technology, engineering, math, and it's a very sort of, you know, straight looking at just doing math and doing science. But I, we try to tell kids every time we talk to them, like STEM gives you the background to do pretty much any industry today has some technology involved in it, no matter what it is. And so even though you might be passionate about an industry, you could still have a STEM background and still be effective in that industry, whether it be in agriculture or healthcare or whatever it is. So yeah, so super, super exciting about the work you guys have been doing for sure. Uh, so Kathleen, can you share a little bit about like BP? Certainly we talked a little bit about what we did on Wednesday, but I know BP has been sort of engaged in this work and been part of Million Mentors as well over the years. So love to hear hear from you. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, it is, it's incredible to hear my colleagues and the work that's being done and the focus around it. Um, at BP, um, we're working every day to make sure that we provide um, the energy the world needs. And with that is we need talent. We need a lot of talent and we will continue to need um, um, so much talent for the future. And we are really focused on making sure that we provide access um, support, accessibility, equity, um, and um, at BP, and one of the really the really wonderful things I, I like to mention that I'm very proud of is out of our executive le leadership team of 11, um, we have seven females 
at that executive team level. So that's obviously more than half and um, very, very proud. And throughout the company, we are we are very focused on, on gender parity and um, um, throughout and support. But from an early um, engagement perspective, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the programs that we're doing because um, we are, our focus really is around how do we engage and support education and skills and the talent across the communities we serve. We talked a little bit about BRGs. We last year we we launched a BRG um, that was our social mobility BRG. And that's really focused on how do we engage and support individuals, kind of like myself, who have not really had um, um, access to a lot of opportunities and how do we encourage that and continue engagement. And we're providing a lot of opportunities for them to engage through mentorship, through volunteerism. We also have a lot of programs internally that help us develop not only our soft skills, but also our technology skills. A couple of the programs specifically externally that I'm proud of, and I was actually this Wednesday, we talked a little bit, Kate mentioned, and you mentioned our program, but the girls, um, the mentors, um, it was a girls in STEM mentorship partnership. Our mentors are working with them all through this uh, semester, um, creating some very, very um, endearing partnerships and friendships, um, also doing a lot of activities and engagement, but also creating a lot of inspiration and celebration of the talents that they have and being able to notice um, where they might have to learn something, but that's okay. And I think that was one of the celebrations we talked about as a group was we don't all have all of the skills like everyone else, but individually we have um, our own capabilities. And that's what makes us special from a diversity perspective and being able to understand um, your um, strengths and be able to, to count on others to bring out other um, opportunities. Um, in addition to the Girls in STEM mentorship partnership with, um, with the Emphasis team, both the Emphasis Business and the Emphasis Foundation, we have a program that I'm very proud of as well. And this is really targeted at um, high school students that are first generation um, that have been accepted into a university um, and particularly in engineering. Our program is called BP Bridge. And that program is a bridge program for these students to be able to over the summer um, be really in a room with all other um, students that are similar backgrounds to them but their skills development, it's a three and a half day program. There is a scholarship component to that program as well as being away and having that independence. But more than anything else, our BP employees have um, a mentorship component added where each student will have a mentor for one year of that engineering, of their first year of, of engineering. And the rationale behind that and what we found is when you're looking at a first generation engineering student, it seems that that first year is very, very critical. Um, and so um, we want to make sure that they have what they need, that they are supported, they have questions, they have a mentor. Um, and then those mentorships go over time. Um, and what we've also found in students that don't have um, the same social uh, mobility background, the second year tends to be a lot harder for them. And so we are trying to build programs that really answer questions and provide guidance and support. Um, we have several um, female programs. We have our partnership with AFS Intercultural Programs, which is a virtual um, study abroad program just for female students. Um, it is um, called the, the Accelerator Program. Um, and let me see, we do have work experience programs that we are really trying to bring students onto campus to really have a sense and ask questions. Many of the girls um, that we bring in probably have not been into a formal corporate um, setting. And so these are all um, programs that I think open up the opportunities, the possibilities. Um, we really, really enforce asking questions because there is no um, question that is not worthy of asking. And um, so we're just really, really excited um, to be able to have some of these programs in action. Our employees make this possible, right? They volunteer, they support it. So everyone behind the mission 
um, is, is, is really, really critical, I think. And so um, I'm just really excited about the steps that we're making, both with our external programs, but also with some programs we're doing internally to make sure that we have um, you know, um, support for capability building, et cetera, within right. our, within our teams. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Kathleen. Excellent. And just thanks for sharing the breadth of what's going on. I think all four of your organizations have a lot going on, obviously. So I think we can fill up this whole hour, just telling what you're doing, but definitely uh, for you, Orietta, you know, can you talk a little bit about definitely the work that Intel's been doing and around some that you already discussed, but how mentorship and networking opportunities really can be leverage for the professional development of women in STEM, you know, particularly as they get a little bit more into their career. You're on mute. We have to say that once in every webinar. It's a requirement. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I will be, so Intel has K through 12 all the way to PhD, and we have programs across that whole spectrum. Um, in 2020, the Intel Foundation had this idea of how do I get a million youth girls um, engaged with STEM? And so they set this goal, a million girls by 2025, five years, we'll get to it. Well, we partnered with Million Girls Moonshot and STEM Next. And um, in 2023, just three years into the program, we reached 2.2 million girls, 4 million total youth, 310,000 educators. You know, two thirds of the youth were low income, 58 identified as um, BIPOC and 20% lived in rural areas. And so we made this goal and we went out to figure out how to solve it. And what we learned from that on the K through 12, that it's not just about getting them exposed to STEM, but how do we get them in a, like a deep engagement? And so our focus now is looking at deep engagements on sessions that are more than one session with the student, several hours with that same student engaging with STEM, with STEM programs. The other um, program that we have at the high school um, community college um, that Intel has started is called AI for Workforce Program. And this is a program that we are partnering with community colleges. And we have uh, like 110 uh, community colleges in 39 states who have joined the program. And um, we provide 500 hours of free AI content um, and courses, um, professional faculty training, uh, implementation guidance, um, and manages the peer community. So in this program, we're really looking at sometimes there are certain students after high school or the four-year program isn't for them. And this AI for workforce, or if you're retraining or getting back into the workforce, this is one of the, one of the programs we're focused on. On the collegiate side, we partner um, with all of the SWE, NSBE, SHIP, ACES. And often we have mentors for, um, for those students. Um, we also work very closely with our ERGs um, to, to, to get um, students involved. We have an Intel Scholars Program. Um, and so for us, when we talk about mentoring and network, it's about all of that. And in all of those programs, there's an aspect of mentorship because it's really driven by our volunteers. Our employees are volunteering to do STEM camps, to um, go and talk to students, to bring students in to talk to them in these programs. And mentorship is very important. And you know, one of the things um, as, a, as a first gen, you know, Kathleen mentioned it, it, it's hard. You know, I went to college and that first year, um, I actually was undecided. And I had five degrees that I thought I wanted to do. And I met my advisor and he was like, uh, you need to pick a degree by the end of the semester. You know, I thought you had four years to pick a degree. No one told me you had to declare it sooner, right? And so this aspect of mentorship is very important because I know for me, it was very important to have a mentor in college, but also at work and networking and being able to be around others where you feel comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. We often have women in mentoring circles and um, where we're able to talk about things that are 
there are certain things that are unique to women. Like we have children, how we how it's different after having children and what we're going through. We have different things, phases of our lives um, when we're single, through marriage, through children, through caring for our elders. And throughout that time, there's, there's these circles where you need to be talking to other women about how did you do it? How are you managing that? And then also work because we have to, be able to bring our true selves to work. And the importance of these networking is not just about, it's networking for how do I learn something? How do I get my next job, my next promotion? But it's really, it's our lives, mm -hmm. right? And, and these are the women and men that we spend most of our time with. And this sense of, of vulnerability, the sense of being honest and being talking and talking through what we're going through. I think that goes a long way, especially when, when we talk about mentoring and networking. That is beautiful. I mean, I wish you could just like capture what you just said, because I think it's so important. And I think that was already reflected. If you heard Kate talk about the fact we've been doing this mentoring program with middle school students, girls, but what they loved about it was the camaraderie, the relationships they were building. And I think, you know, sometimes we talk about STEM over here and then we're women over here. And really we have to bring our whole self together and be able to be in an environment where we can share and, and feel vulnerable and be transparent and not be worried that you're going to be judged uh, because it is different. I mean, what we go through is is very different just by the nature of the world. And so having that understanding and particularly like for me, you know, I didn't have any women mentors at all because there weren't any women ahead of me in career wise. And so I had to rely on men to be my mentors. And so, you know, it was a, it was a struggle at time to find men that I could trust besides my own husband, whom I married, who was also a chemical engineer, you know, apples and trees. My dad's a chemical engineer too. Just can't change, can't fight city hall. But, you know, but I didn't have someone that was a woman like me that was also raising kids. And I mean, I worked at home, telecommuted 35 years ago. That wasn't even heard of then. And my engineering company, they said, well, you want to do what? And I said, well, can I work at home and I have a kid? Can I work at home? And they let me. And it was even on TV. It was like such a unique thing today. We don't even think about it. But, you know, there just weren't those people that were ahead of, of me. And so hearing you guys and knowing that you're sort of creating an environment where these young women and particularly like these middle school girls that we saw today can go into that is so inspiring, so powerful, so powerful, or yet the beautiful. Um, so obviously it's not always been this beautiful, like, oh, everything works out, you know, right? <laughs> there's there's some challenges. So I know, Smitha, particularly with PepsiCo, as you guys have really been you know, leading. And, and again, I think when we met PepsiCo, there was very little sort of STEM conversation kind of going on internally, particularly around women. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges and maybe how you guys overcame those as you've seen, as you've built what you do today, which is, you know, amazing? Yes. Thanks, Sheila. So some of the challenges, as, as I think about what challenges women face, particularly not just in the workplace, but in STEM, um, unconscious bias, that that uh, is still a prevalent um, opportunity. Um, PepsiCo has put into place some strategies around that with some training that we have for unconscious bias um, and stereotypes. And then it's also this concept of allyship. So we talked about, um, we heard Arietta talk about um, mentoring circles, and we have a similar concept at PepsiCo with mentoring circles. We take that a step further too with allyship. So it's allyship in the moment. When you see a a microaggression or some um, evidence of something that's um, an unconscious bias that we all have and, and flips out, how do you create that support network of allies within uh, the context that can step up and, and support in that moment um, the person that's the recipient of that unconscious bias? Um, it's also uh, being that trailblazer or pioneer or having those, uh, the lack of role models. Um, we've done a good job of of showcasing some prominent field, female leaders in, um, and recording those videos and making them available to, uh, to the organization where they're transparent and they're vulnerable and they're sharing their career stories, the personal challenges they endured sometimes around those types of unconscious biases or uh, career um, 
uh, where they were perceived to not be to be able to be progress in their careers because they were women and being transparent in how they overcame them. And then um, as we think about work life, I don't, I don't like the word work-life balance because balance is personal to everyone. Work-life choices, right? Um, how do we really foster an environment where people can feel like um, they have the ability at a fundamental level of part of their objectives to achieve their work, their personal work-life choice? Um, and in, in some cases too, um, we have uh, programs that uh, are targeted or focused on women leadership development, uh, particularly the Transformational Leadership Program, um, which is really focused on um, equipping women with the tools they need to elevate their business impact and achieve career fulfillment. Um, now, with that, it's also skills to navigate a global matrix organization, increase their influence and effectiveness, but also set boundaries, which is very important because a lot of times we, as women, aren't as verbal about our boundaries mm -hmm. because we feel that's gonna be held against us, right? Um, and so that's another way in which we're, we're, we're finding ways to inspire women and encourage them to overcome those challenges. And then one thing that I didn't mention earlier um, that's relevant here is, and it plays to what Orietta said as well, um, you know, we, uh, I'm personally part of a sandwich generation taking care of two sets of elderly parents and a young family. And so I've got those commitments. And um, when I came back from maternity leave, uh, it was a, a different experience. But since that time, um, you know, PepsiCo is really focused on returnship programs, right? Mm -hmm. um, fostering returnship through a ready to return program, because that's equally important. It's mm -hmm. how do you provide um, women a platform, again, to share their stories, but also uh, have have that vulnerability and learning from each other and, and sharing those common experiences and what it's like to return after some period of time, whether you're starting your family or going to get uh, another degree or educational program or taking a mental health and wellness break, right? Those things are also important and they shouldn't have um, the stigma that's traditionally or historically been attached to them. So how do you provide women that safe space to return ship? Yeah, I mean, so, so important because it's not always just about, you know, being in STEM, right? There's so many other things that are, are really, you know, impacting what we do on a daily basis. And, you know, I think you guys have highlighted just amazing things. And again, you know, I'm, I'm going to challenge everybody at the end of a call to action because, you know, this isn't just about listening to this webinar and hearing all these great things that these companies are doing. This is about everyone that's on this call or that will be watching this webinar to think about for themselves and to give themselves permission to be, like you said, uh, Smitha, vulnerable, transparent. You know, what are your challenges that you're having and, and how do you find people who will help sort of break some of those down for you? You know, um, I love when we were our first launching Million Mentors, we talked about not just mentoring, but advocacy. And so, you know, again, mentoring can also mean advocating even when you're not in the room. And so finding those champions that will champion you even when you're not in the room is a critical component of advancing, you know, your career or your life in general, just making sure there are people that will protect you. Because I think the one thing we're not good at is saying no, all right? Everything that comes to us, oh yeah, we can do that. We can do that. And then we're up till two o'clock in the morning because we keep doing, saying yes to everything that was presented to us and we're still doing so many other things. So um, Kate, I would love for you to talk a little bit about, because I think you have, you know, some vision, I think that would be valuable to the audience, you know, around like, what do you see in the future? Like, obviously we've done some things, we've done a lot of work together. And, and again, you know, what Intel and PepsiCo and BP and Infosys have been doing is marvelous, but there's more to be done. And so can you talk a little bit about maybe what some of your vision is for that? Oh, wow. Um, I was invited like two weeks ago, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation did their International Women's Day event. And I was asked, you know, what's the world going to look like in 20 years on my panel? And I had a small heart attack because I feel like with AI, we don't know what's even happening tomorrow. And so I said, okay, can we, as far as the vision goes in the immediate, 
we are all living alongside these young girls and our wider peer group in an age of technology. It is like exploding before us. But it made me think of like that superpower of women. Um, when we get fearful of the robotic dog or whatever it may be taking over the world, um, I think even more than in the past, there'll be the need for the humanity and the real, the human side that is uh, not lost as the technology explodes. And as women, we have very high IQ. We have the ability to multitask. We have the ability to relate to others and pose the kinds of questions that we need to be posing. So I want to say that I see an even greater role for women in this tech space or the tech enabled world. And we need to really double down on making sure these girls know very early on what exists and that they are part of this equation. And I wrote, you know, just that spectrum and Orietta, you're doing such an amazing job in all the areas at Intel. So you and I still have to have that conversation that we haven't had, but I think um, it is the kind of work that goes on with my organization and some of the others who are popping through the chat that are working in the K-12 years. Let's set the foundation. Let's work on the mindset of families, of students, of educators, and get the conversation going at the right time. Let's shepherd young women through their higher ed journey. And that doesn't have to be at a very fancy, I know you aspire to MIT and you got there, Orietta, but our community colleges are doing incredible work. And I think girls need a hand to be held to guide them. And then once they make it into the corporation, not forgetting, I think Kathleen, as you were saying, like year one and two, like girl, women, young women may get in, but then what? Who is shepherding them through? So my vision is for us all to work collaboratively across that entire spectrum and, and keep an eye open for the small ways that we can help. And I don't know if I'm getting another question before today closes. So I just want to also say like little, little actions. I think the theme of International Women's Day around inspired inclusion and that while Pepsi and Intel and Infosys, we have many resources to do these impressive large scale programs as individual women and men who, who joined us all the small actions that you can take to be intentional about your language, referring to young girls as future leaders, keeping an eye open to one or two who you can just nudge along, separate to or complementing these like big, powerful um, programs that all of us are driving um, each day. So yeah. working on my vision, but those are some that, that's amazing. And you read my mind because that was going to be the question that I was going to wrap up with. So you answered it already. Um, but, you know, just to quickly say also to, you know, particularly for women, and I think you talked about this, Kate, the whole idea of, um, you know, AUW did a study and it showed that girls want career paths where we're helping society. And so I think you talk about that, you know, from a technology perspective, things are rapidly changing, but I think the inherent still want for girls and really millennials, I think all, you know, are caring more about society and, and wanting to do that. And so definitely agree with that, you know, humanity is going to be needed and it can't be, you know, it cannot all be programmed. It has to be, there has to be some touchy feely, feely moments of it. And, you know, I think you guys talked about, you know, that transferring from year one to year two, I will say, you know, my, our oldest daughter went to Georgia tech in engineering, you know, geeky like her parents. And, um, but from year one to year two, they've had such a dropout rate of girls that were in engineering that they actually started a mentoring program. Unbeknownst, like it wasn't planned. It was just like, we're going to pair you with a mentor, a student that's higher than you, a girl, so that we can do that. And they reduced the dropout rate like by 50% in year one. So we can, I think to your point, everybody can do a little bit. We don't have to do it all. We can do a little bit. And so as we wrap up, you know, um, definitely Kate gave us hers one minute each. Tell tell me, like, give the audience some ideas of what are some little things maybe that they can do and think about again. So Kathleen, start with you. And one minute. 
I would just say, um, get involved. Um, think about the things that your company can do, where you have alignments, where you have support, um, have communications with your employees, um, get people that are like-minded to build committees, if, if that would be helpful to support some areas um, and, and maybe align some things find a school. You don't have to be everything to everyone. You can find an alignment with a school and make a contribution there um, if that's what you want. But um, um, absolutely, there's so many things you can do and um, and just get started. Great. Okay, Smita. I'm going to further something Catherine said. Um, you know, the, the concept of allyship is something, again, you don't need a big corporation um, behind you and lots of funding and, and community outreach. It's something so simple in the moment to elevate anybody that's from an underrepresented community. When yeah. you sense that somebody is the is the recipient of uh, something that has to do with unconscious bias, find a way to support that person in the moment. That means so much, and it gets everybody to rethink um, uh, how they perceive. Uh, the recipient of that unconscious bias. So it's something that small, it's something we can all do as yeah. however we identify. And so encourage everyone to really focus and, and um, cultivate allyship. All right, Orietta. For me, my advice is if you're a parent or you're around young children, whether that's family members or children of your friends, encourage that little girl to seek science and engineering. If she's looking at leaves or interested in a bug or these animals, tell them about science. Say, hey, you can be a scientist one day. If they're interested in looking at things or how it works or how things move, say, hey, you'll be an engineer. There's not enough of us at home who's telling kids you can be an engineer or a scientist. We talk about lawyers and doctors and, and, and dancers and firemen, and there's nothing wrong with those professions. But at home, we need to talk about you can be a scientist one day or you can be an engineer. So my ask is if you have young kids or around young kids, always encourage that as a profession for them because they not, might not know what that profession is or that it exists. Um, at work, at work, I would encourage you to um, seek out, really understand, you know, women. And, um, you know, we talked about, you know, I think Smita talked about allyship. We need allies yes. and we need mentors too. And the, the truth is for women to progress, it's not up to women to help women progress. It's right. up to all of us. And so my call to action is how are you helping a woman or a young girl get into STEM or progress in their career in STEM? And that could be in many ways, you know, mentorship, um, allyship, advocacy, volunteering. And yes. so just look at your community. Yes, for sure. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for amazing. As we wrap up, I want to turn it over to Dr. Joe Weber, who is a wonderful STEM woman herself, and she's going to share some really exciting things that Million Mentors has been involved in um, internationally. Joe. Sure. And I know we're right on the uh, top of the hour. So uh, just really, it's a real quick thing here. You know, the four companies who spoke today, PepsiCo, Infosys, Intel, and BP, are all global companies. And I wanted to talk a moment on international initiatives. The 2023 gender gap report, the global gender gap report is now available. And Janine, I'll ask you if you could just share that in the chat. Um, coming in dead last on the global gender gap is Afghanistan. And 130 million women and girls worldwide are currently being denied and education. So last week in Washington, D.C., we were very excited when Senate, uh, sorry, Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken, who's pretty busy in the Middle East right now, he actually. Oh. Did we lose? Did being used as a backbone. Oh. Sorry, do you guys lose me? Yes, we did. Are we good? Yeah. Okay, but I think just uh, if you can go on to just go on to the next slide here. Um, just really wanted to call out that uh, very excited about this program. We've already got some early 
feedback coming in from the girls about how much they're appreciating having these these mentors. And you guys know it's all about the people. Sheila Bilt Boynton has been a pivotal member of MWM since its inception. Margaret Milken and the Women in Insurance Network have taken an older traditional industry and brought it to life. Margaret recognizes that there are many women at the entry positions in insurance, but they disappear as they get closer to the top. MWM Turkey is also seeing this. They just celebrated their third year of MWM Turkey. And a key person there, uh, I don't know if she's on the call today, is Melek Palatnikat. Now, Melek last week said something as they celebrated their three year, and I'm just gonna tell you about it. I looked it up. The World Bank recently reported that a 1% increase in the share of female fun firm managers leads to a 0.5% decrease in carbon dioxide em emissions. So not only is hiring and promoting women the right thing to do, it might just save the planet. And with that, I'm gonna turn back to Sheila. Great, thank you guys again. Thank you to Joe for the amazing work that you guys are doing with all of these projects. And again, to Kathleen, Kate, Smita, Orietta. I mean, what an amazing, impactful hour. I knew it would fly by, I told you it would. Uh, I think we could go for all afternoon, um, but I know people have other things to do and get out there. And again, I think as we said, Anything you do is more than nothing. So don't judge yourself so harshly. You don't have a thousand hours to do things. One hour, having coffee, whatever, can really make an impact on, on someone's life. So I, again, wishing everybody a happy International Women's Day um, and hope that you get out there and, uh, and thank you to everybody for everything that you're doing to STEM Connector, Ted Wells, and to Kylie for her amazing organization of this webinar. We couldn't do it without you, Kylie. Um, and thanks again, all. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.